Welcome back to the Kennedy Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Allison, and today I've got a packed episode for you. But I first have to start with some really exciting news that I've been teasing for a little while and finally can tell you all. I am officially partnered with a network, which is very exciting. So I am now a part of Evergreen Podcast Network. And being on a network was something that I actually wrote on my 2022 bucket list for the podcast. I just felt like it was a good next step and honestly didn't know if that would happen this year or anytime soon. But um, not long after that, uh, Evergreen and I started communicating and it just was the best fit ever. And I'm thrilled to be a part of their network. So if you hear new ads in here or you now see that Evergreen Podcast is on Apple Podcasts under where it says Kennedy Dynasty Podcast, that's because now I am with them. So very exciting for the podcast and for me and for all of us in general, because it just means that, you know, hopefully there'll be even more growth for the podcast and more new things and big good things. So very excited and thrilled to be working with them. So to get started, let's do our In the News segment. Big a new story of the past seven days. Okay, this news is really super niche and only really helps if you live in Milwaukee. But when I was looking up news stories this week, this one popped up and I thought it was really cool. So if you live in Milwaukee, there is currently a play running that is called Rose, An Intimate Evening with Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. And it's literally like a one-woman show where she speaks about her life and all kinds of stuff. And it just looks really cool. So anyway, I just want to let you know if you're in the area, go check out this play at Renaissance Theater Works. Next for our inspiring clip of the week. One of the inspiring notes. Okay, this is a heavy one, but I decided this week that although I've played probably parts of this speech before multiple times, I'm going to include it this week because of the just absolutely tragic, horrible, disgusting hate crime that happened in Buffalo this week. So I'm going to insert a clip from JFK's civil rights speech and... I just want you guys to know I'm so deeply bothered and saddened by this news, of course, as we all are, and I'm just really praying for the victim's family and friends, and I didn't want to not mention it on this podcast because it's just horrific. So um, here is the clip. It ought to be possible, in short, for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race or his color. In short, every American ought to have the right to be treated as he would wish to be treated as one would wish uh, his children to be treated. But this is not the case. The Negro baby born in America today, regardless of the section of the state in which he is born, has about one half as much chance of completing a high school as a white baby, born in the same place on the same day. One third as much chance of completing college. One third as much chance of becoming a professional man twice as much chance of becoming unemployed, about one-seventh as much chance of earning $10,000 a year, a life expectancy which is seven years shorter, and the prospects of earning only half as much. This is not a sectional issue. Difficulties over segregation and discrimination exist in every city, in every state of the Union, producing in many cities a rising tide of discontent that threatens the public safety. Nor is this a partisan issue. In a time of domestic crisis, men of goodwill and generosity should be able to unite regardless of party or politics. This is not even a legal or legislative issue alone. It is better to settle these matters in the courts than on the streets, and new laws are needed at every level. But law alone cannot make men see right. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public. If he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if in short he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed 
and stand in his place. Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? One hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. Next up is our recommendation segment. Of course, then we would uh, recommend it. This week, I am recommending the book Jackie's Girl by Kathy McCown because we are going to be talking about her today, and it's one of my main sources for today as well. So I wanted to make sure that I recommended it, and if you have not read it, it's so good. I finished it very quickly when I read it a few years ago. I'm going to have a direct link to buy it in the notes of this episode. So I don't know if you've noticed a little bit of a theme here, but I've recently just been really interested in studying the people that have worked for or with the Kennedys. I feel like all these people just had such a look into their lives that obviously it's hard for any of us to conceptualize or none of us have had that one-on-one experience with them, like the people that lived within their homes or looked after them or all those kinds of things. I've just become really interested in that lately. So there was a listener who actually reached out to me telling me that I should read the book if I hadn't already because it would be a great source. And when she did, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do an episode on Kathy because she seemed like a really neat and pivotal human being in the Kennedy story. My sources today are Fox, Jackie's Girl, the book that she wrote, and Daily Mail. So I'm going to get started just telling a little bit of a background and about how they met. I'm just going to kind of tell a few of the stories that are within the book that I found really interesting and uh, just kind of gave a look into Jackie and even the children too that I feel like I had never read or seen in this way before. Kathy McCown was actually an immigrant from Ireland. She was 19 years old when she came to work in the United States for the first time in 1964. And at the beginning of her work, she was working for another family who was just terrible. She worked for this woman who was just the worst and rude and just made her self-conscious and feel terrible about herself always, treated her like garbage. So the reason she even got in contact with Jackie Kennedy or had the ability to interview for the job of her personal assistant is because she had a cousin named Jack Maloney who was a New York City policeman who had been assigned to do crowd control over at the Kennedy's building. And it says in the book that he'd become pals with this regular agent, a Boston-born and bred Irishman in his 60s by the name of John James O'Leary, who preferred to be called Muggsy. Muggsy tipped off Jack that Miss Kennedy was looking for a nice Irish girl to fill a position as a live-in domestic on her staff. So, when that happened, Kathy went over to interview at the Kennedy's home. And I I love the story of this so much because I'm actually going to insert a clip of her talking about it as well. But the way she got hired was she walked in the house, waited for Miss Kennedy, and was told to go over to the living room, basically. And John Jr. comes in with his dog, Shannon. And John Jr. kind of does a trick with Shannon. And she says, wow, that's amazing that you taught him how to do this. All the while, Miss Kennedy was watching from the hallway the whole time. So Jackie walks in and says, I'm Jackie. You know, they meet, blah, blah, blah. And she says, basically, do you want the job? And Kathy was shocked because she hadn't interviewed. She didn't know. But I guess Jackie had watched her with John and seen how wonderful she was and thought that she would be a wonderful fit. And Jackie said, can you start tomorrow? And so Kathy kind of frantically is like, I don't know. I have this other person I work for. Like, how am I going to get out of that? I need a two weeks notice at least. And And Jackie was like, can you tell her today that you're quitting and start tomorrow? And Kathy was like, you know what? Yeah, I can. So she did. And according to the book, it was one of the best decisions of her life. All of a sudden, this little boy comes down the hallway with his dog. And he said, my name is John. And I said, my name is Kathy. And he says, do you want to see my dog doing a trick? And I said, oh, yeah, I'd love to see your dog doing a trick. So he put his hand in his pocket and he lift up the beautiful silk cushion and he put the bone in there and he says, go, go Shannon, go, go. And then all of a sudden this lady came in and, you know, stood at the door. She says, John, what are you doing? You're ruining my couch. And she said, I'm Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, your name is Kathy, right? And then I said, yes. And she said, uh, um, um, when can you start? <laughs> Fast. I was waiting for her to sit down and have a big chat with me, but no. Little John and his dog tricks helped you. Little John interviewed me with his dog. (laughs) He did. 
One of my favorite stories that I read in this book, and I won't be able to quote it verbatim, obviously, but I just wanted to tell it to you anyway. It was the first morning she walks into Jackie's room to like get her up for the morning, bring her breakfast, tea, all that kind of stuff. And Kathy kind of leads up to saying she was so nervous anyway, because you don't know really how people want things to be done until you get in there for the first or second or third time and understand the routine. So she said she kind of walked in, already felt nervous and weird. She's wearing these shoes that were like plasticky nurse-like shoes. And she said that her, I guess her feet were sweating or something. And so they were squeaking. You know how that happens sometimes where your soul will like squeak on your shoe. So she's mortified because she walks into Jackie's room and is already squeaking and that's making her more nervous and more awkward feeling. She's thinking in her head, okay, I got to get to some powder. I got to, I got to do something to fix these stinking shoes. So she gives Jackie her paper, runs in the bathroom to kind of act like she's fiddling with something, finds some powder in Jackie's drawer and puts it in her shoes and they're silent so Kathy's like oh thank goodness they're silent I'm good Oof, no sweat walks back out and realizes that she is bringing clouds of white powder every time she steps just a cloud a cloud a cloud every step and she's leaving marks on the carpet along the way she freaks out and realizes, okay, Jackie's not looking at me so maybe I can figure out a way to get this cleaned up or to do something with her not paying attention and she kind of goes I think in the closet and just puts her head down and Jackie walks in there and is like, Kathy, are you okay? Jackie thinks she's sobbing. And all of a sudden, Kathy says she just felt so awkward that she started laughing and she was laughing the whole time. And they both, she just came clean with the story and they both busted out laughing. And Jackie thought it was hilarious and instantly told the rest of the staff how funny Kathy was. And it was a bonding moment for them. And I feel like this is just a great look at who Jackie was from what I've read. Just kind of go with the flow, not so stiff. And yeah, she was clear classy and proper and had amazingly nice things and all of these amazing bougie things but at the end of the day she was real and she thought it was hilarious that the girl had gotten into her powder because she was mortified her feet were squeaking (laughs) another thing that kathy encountered on her time there was that she was devastated because she had apparently gained like 30 to 40 pounds when she got back in the u.s and she tells more of the story about how she did in the book, and I don't want to spoil the whole thing for you, but basically she was eating like loaves of bread and mayonnaise all the time, which I know that sounds nasty to us, but to her, she had never had that kind of bread or mayonnaise, and she thought it was amazing. And so she was eating it like crazy and gained weight, I guess. There was actually a news article that released very recently, within the last couple of months, about how terrible Jackie Kennedy was for the diet that she adhered to and the diet that she then put Kathy on because Kathy asked for Jackie's help to lose weight. And like I said, she's gotten some heat for that lately um, because obviously that's not really the culture we try to perpetuate or put out anymore. But at the time, I guess it is what it is. So I want to tell you a little bit of what the diet was and what Jackie Kennedy ate in a day. I, I ended up doing kind of a deep dive because I found this record of Jackie Kennedy's skincare routine and diet and all the stuff that she followed while in the White House. And... I'm going to read you just snippets of it. This is a typewritten letter from a dermatologist about Miss Kennedy's consultation on May 1st of 1963. I'm not even going to get into every single detail because it is like super intricate, but it, it has to do with certain oils. She could put certain oil on her underarms and on her face. And she, the doctor told her to walk, but Miss Kennedy was terrified to walk all the time because she didn't want to get varicose veins and she couldn't walk in Washington anyway because she would be seen and... Um, She promised that she would walk around the golf course in Cape Cod. The doctor stresses the importance of never applying more oil or cream on her face than what it was advised. Here, this is interesting coming from a dermatologist in 1963. Get this. So she said that she'll stay out of the sun while on the Cape and always will wear a hat. But the doctor said not necessary because sun is good for her and that she should not be afraid of getting brown spots. He will make them fade in the fall. I thought that was hilarious because that goes against everything every dermatologist now says. I mean, my dermatologist is like, Allison, please stay out of the sun. But I just thought that was funny. So 1963 dermatologist said, sun is great. Get out in the sun. She had certain oils to massage into arms and legs. She had an oil that she was given to use on her skin for dry skin. And she was also supposed to use it on JFK's back because it was apparently dry. But it's noted here that Miss Kennedy said that he would not do a skincare routine. There's a menu here as well that I'm going to read to you in a minute. And she was advised to drink champagne because it was good for her. That is a very interesting little medical record. That's on Refinery29 if you want to go look it up. You can see the actual record scanned in. But to backtrack, Kathy was put on this diet to help her lose weight. And it is essentially what Jackie ate in a day as well. 
And this is from the Daily Mail, but also is accurate in the book as well. Okay, so it says for breakfast, she would have a boiled egg and some tea. For lunch, she would have cottage cheese with fruit. And for dinner, she would have a poached chicken breast or fish with a salad or steamed vegetables. If she got hungry during the day, then she would have a snack of plain yogurt. And in the book, Kathy shares that she didn't really like plain yogurt. So Jackie Kennedy told her to put some instant coffee mix in it and it made it like pudding or something. So that is what she ate every day of her life. Daily Mail has it calculated here, a total of 568 to 620 calories. So way under the healthy <laughs> amount of calories that you're supposed to have in a day. So I'm not advising this at all. I'm just letting you guys know this was a big part of the book that this is the diet she and Miss Kennedy adhered to. But Kathy does admit that she found Miss Kennedy multiple times with a spoon and some ice cream by the fridge. She found her eating grilled cheeses. So it's not like she didn't indulge sometimes, but wow, she followed a strict diet for sure. Again, I do not condone that diet at all. Kathy becomes just a really big part of the family. She was supposed to be Jackie's personal assistant only, but she was almost like a nanny a little bit, really bonded with the children, was obviously really trustworthy and was taken all over the place with them. She would go to Cape Cod with them and vacation in the summers. There's one story in the book where she kept seeing some teenage cousins in Hyannisport snickering by Jackie Kennedy's garden. And she goes out and looks and she brings, I think, I believe one of the security guards with her and they realize that the teen cousins had planted marijuana in Miss Kennedy's garden. So Kathy runs and tells Miss Kennedy and Jackie's horrified one. And two, John and Caroline weren't old enough to have planted it. So it was the older cousins. And she said, no one can find out about this. We got to pull it up immediately. And that's kind of a funny moment in the book that she shares. So she obviously was just really invested in the family's lives. And she and Jackie, she talks about almost had like a sisterly bond. I'm going to insert a clip here of Kathy talking about something that occurred at the funeral after Bobby's assassination because she was there for all of that. It was when they were riding the train back to Arlington. She said that the children heard something bang on the side of the train car and John Jr. grabbed Kathy's arm and said, Cat, is someone shooting at us? Are they coming to get us next? And it was just a really sad, terrible moment for her to realize that these kids obviously had so much tragedy surrounding them. So I'm going to insert that clip here. Somebody threw a reed, like a Christmas reed, to the window. And John said, had to come in to get us too? I said, no, John, no, that, that was somebody very sad for, for your uncle. He thought it was a gunshot. Yes, he thought it was a gunshot, yeah. So not only does Kathy's life really center around the Kennedys, she also has a little bit of her own life outside too. The book tells about her kind of going and dancing and making friends and stuff. And so she meets a guy named Seamus, who she actually ends up marrying later. And she tells a lot of stories about him in the book. And one of my favorite ones is they had plans to go do something. And Miss Kennedy at last moment was like, no, I need you to stay with us. And so Kathy unfortunately had to call Seamus and say, hey, sorry that you paid for these tickets to this event, but I can't go. And he was just furious. He was like, okay, why are these people controlling your life? It's not your hours, whatever. So Jackie sees that Kathy is clearly upset on the phone and picks up the phone and says, this is Jackie Kennedy. I'm sorry. It's all my fault. It's not Kathy's fault be upset with me not her and just owns the whole situation and Kathy talks about in the book how that had to be just so crazy for Seamus to all of a sudden be on the phone with Mrs. Kennedy and be told that and I mean what's he gonna say after that Jackie really cared about Kathy's life as well and the people in her life and I think that's a really sweet moment after Kathy and Seamus really started heating up, and obviously they were together, that he proposed, they were going to get married. Jackie was so kind, and her gift to them, she wanted them to check out her storage unit and pick out furniture, basically anything they wanted. And Kathy obviously didn't want to go in there and just be like, okay, we want it all. But she said it was crazy to walk through and see all the artifacts, basically, like historic things that were in her storage unit, because that was just Jackie's life to have all of these items but she said that you could see that you know there were pieces of furniture that were president kennedy's there were different things like that and they took a few of them for their home as a gift from jackie and i just think what an amazing heirloom and obviously a testament to how much jackie loved her to allow her to have these pieces 
Kathy also saw the introduction and marriage of Aristotle Onassis into Jackie's life. He actually gave her $1,000 and a card of well wishes, and Jackie and the children even attended her wedding, which was just amazing to her. She didn't think that they would take time out of their lives to kind of come to her wedding, who, I mean, honestly, wasn't as nice as the, you know, events that Miss Kennedy, she assumed, attended all the time, but they did, and there's pictures from that, and I love it so much. And I noticed one thing that I'm going to note about Jackie. I mean, y'all know I love her anyway, but I noticed in the photos of the wedding, because there's one specifically where Jackie is looking at Kathy's new wedding ring. And Jackie, I looked really closely. She's wearing no earrings. I didn't see any rings on her except for a very simple wedding band. I didn't see a lot of jewelry. She was wearing a nice outfit, of course, but nothing flashy. And I thought how that was probably really intentional because she wanted to not stand out and look you know, filthy rich and bougie and all this kind of stuff at a a normal wedding. And I thought that was amazing. I know that Jackie always took so much time and consideration into what she did and what she wore, but I just thought that was an extra element of careful consideration when attending anybody, somebody else's event. So Kathy, though, after a while, she had worked for them for so many years and she started having kids of her own. And so she told Mrs. Kennedy she wouldn't be able to work full time, obviously, anymore. She had to take care of her own kids. But then Kathy actually went on to work the summers at the Cape from basically for years. She and her children and Seamus would all go out and work. I think that's really neat that they kept this bond between the two families. Kathy even attended Caroline's wedding. Another story that she tells in the book is about Ron Galella, and we've talked about him in a previous episode. If you haven't listened to it, go check it out. But Ron Galella was obsessed with Jackie Kennedy, if you don't already know, and he was one of the main paparazzi that just bombarded her life. And she tells a story about how there was a maid that was tipping off where Jackie was all the time to Ron Galella. So she would be on the phone and say, okay, Jackie's leaving now. Aristotle's coming now. And Kathy caught her tipping him off. The maid turned to Kathy and said, if you tell, I'll kill you. Well, she did tell. She didn't kill her, obviously. But she cared so much about Jackie that she didn't care what the girl did. She was like, no, I have to <laughs> tell Miss Kennedy. You've been the one behind Rongalella knowing her comings and goings all the time. So I thought that was a really interesting passage of the book to read as well, especially when you know a little more history around him. She kept in touch with Jackie over the years, and obviously the children ended up growing up. She still worked at the Cape in the summers, but they didn't keep in as much contact as they had before. But she and Jackie did keep up enough, and when she found out that she was dying, she sent a letter, and Jackie wrote her back. And when she passed away, she actually did go to pay her respects, and she tells about how there was a comforter, a floral comforter, over Jackie's casket. And how it was one that she had had for a million years, as long as as Kathy had known her. And she remembered as a young girl in the first few weeks of taking care of the Kennedys, she had put that comforter too close to the light in the closet and had burned a hole in it. And she said she remembers just looking over the casket and trying to find that hole in in the fabric of the comforter. And just how that was moving to her, that she had been through so much with this amazing woman who she felt such a bond to. And it was just a a really tender moment in the book. After Jackie's death, she did get to meet Carolyn because Carolyn and John came to the Cape and they were redoing the Kennedy's house there. So this by this point, Kathy wasn't really coming to work the summers anymore because obviously Carolyn and John were about to move in. So there was no need really for her to come work. But she got to meet her and she'd tell stories about how John and Seamus would work on the renovations together and how they were planning them out together. She says that Carolyn wasn't that interested in the renovation process, but that they had a great time meeting together and having dinners and telling stories. They even talk about paparazzi in the stories, and John asked Kathy to please tell Carolyn how Jackie had handled the paparazzi, and that Carolyn just shot back about it and just said, I hate the paparazzi. They're the worst. They're ruining my life, which I can't. I can only imagine how tough it is to deal with them. And so uh, Kathy just had a tender moment of being able to share how Jackie had handled that and how she had seen her handle it for so many years. And that was really not long before uh, John tragically passed away. And I'm not going to ruin that part for you in the book, but she just had a really hard time with that, as you would imagine. I love this book so much. I think it's one of the most endearing looks at someone who worked with the Kennedys. And 
the reason that she wrote this book is because she never spoke out about them or her job with them. And she said that she wanted to leave a book behind for her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, her great-great-grandchildren, and anyone after them to come and be able to read this all and see a bit about her life. So she really just wrote it for her family. And I love that so much. And when you think about it now and you reflect back and now you've written the book and there it is and your pictures and your memories. Yes. How do you think about this whole experience? I can't believe where I ended up and who I worked for. They were so nice to me and they made me part of the family. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. It was kind of just a culmination of stories from the book. Honestly, online, I couldn't find hardly anything about her. There was no background, no nothing. It was really hard to find anything. So really, the book speaks for itself in a lot of ways. So go get this book. Read it. I promise you I've not spoiled the whole thing, even though it seems like I told a lot of stories. I just really like Kathy. I think she's probably a really, really, really good person. And I've always admired her and the way that she handled her job with them. Next week, I have an amazing guest coming on to talk about something really awesome. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. Please rate the podcast five stars and write a positive written review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. It helps the podcast so, so much, and I would really appreciate it. Make sure you are subscribed to our newsletter. It keeps you up to date with all things Kennedy Dynasty, and I will put a direct link to do that in the description of this episode, and I will talk to you guys next week. Come on and vote for Kennedy, vote for Kennedy, keep America strong. Kennedy, he just keeps rolling up. Kennedy, he just keeps rolling up. Kennedy, he just keeps rolling up.